Great. Well, thank you all so much for joining us for the Gilded World of Isabella Stewart Gardner. The life of Boston's arts patroness uh, typifies the lives of many of the wealthy and cultured Americans who lived during the Gilded Age of American history. We will explore the details of Isabella Stewart Gardner's life, friends, travels, and collections. She broke all kinds of rules while setting up her museum, but perhaps we can understand this when we read her personal motto, it is my pleasure. Uh, she arranged things the way she wanted with relationships between objects that may at first escape us. What is left for us is to marvel at the space she created and filled with beautiful things. And so this presentation is led by art historian Mary Woodward, who serves as a guide at several historic New England properties. She previously served as public programs coordinator and educator at the Concord Museum. She has a BA in art history from Furman University and an MA in art history from Emory University. She has more than 40 years of experience in, muse in museums of all shapes and sizes, from the comprehensive collection at the Cleveland Museum of Art to the one room log cabin birthplace of President James K. Polk. Uh, so all uh, nearly 200 of us, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Mary for joining us here this morning. And Mary, you can take it away. Thanks so all much. Right. Thank you so much for the introduction, Robert, and welcome everybody. Um, I'm, I'm hugely flattered and, uh, and let's get started. So Robert's read the introduction. Uh, we will be talking about the gilded world of Isabella Stewart Gardner. Imagine Washington, DC, a city filled with corrupt politicians, powerful millionaires, and captains of industry getting richer and richer while the poor get poorer. Imagine people having strong emotional feelings about whether America's military should intervene in a country's internal conflicts and imagine an ever-growing push to make more things, sell more things, and have more things. Sound like current times? Well, perhaps, but these are some of the conditions found in America during the Gilded Age. The years from the 1870s to the 1920s. The Gilded Age was the name of a novel by Mark Twain and Charles Dudley Warner, published in 1873. The term they coined in their book was used in a derogatory way. It was a satirical look at greed, corruption, and power. But during the same years, great wealth was being generated by American business and being put to good uses. The period has also been called the American Renaissance. Industries grew, iron, steel, railroads, shipping, manufacturing of all kinds, shipbuilding. John D. Rockefeller, who you see at the top of this page, amassed the largest fortune created anywhere by an American at any time so far. Uh, so I give you this in relation, this is sort of, uh, um, calculated for today's values, more or less, what Rockefeller and Vanderbilt were worth, and then four people that we're familiar with in today's, with today's values. And you can, I think, still be amazed at the amount of wealth that was floating around in the world during the Gilded Age. And the rich were eager to acquire culture by collecting art, there was a growing sophistication and elegance in American culture, an educated and refined aspect to the Gilded Age, to be sure. And all of this is a way of describing the life and times that we'll be looking at in just a minute of Isabella Stewart Gardner. The homes that those wealthy people built for themselves, these romantic, historically inspired homes, or as they're known out on, in Newport, cottages, were um, splendors to behold, Italian palazzo, French chateaus, German castles. The breakers seen here, built by Cornelius Vanderbilt's grandson in 1883, is an Italian Renaissance cottage on steroids. There are about 70 rooms in the building. 
This was the world, the gilded world of Isabella Stewart Gardner. She was born in New York City in 1840 to an industrialist and his wife. The Stuart family could trace their ancestry back to the royal Stuarts of Scotland and England. She was educated as society girls were in small private schools and taught things like French and watercolor and piano. Later in life, she was asked, did you study hard? To which she replied, well, if it was against the rules, I did. And then she was asked, what subject did you excel in at school? And she proudly said, I could run faster than anyone else in school. Her parents sent her to a finishing school in Paris as a 16 year old. And perhaps wisely, they went along with their daughter while she was there. As a teenager traveling with her family in Europe, she was inspired by a private museum that she visited in Milan, where, as she wrote later in a journal, a splendid collection was housed in a fine house. She apparently told a friend at the time um, that, uh, who, who then recounted the story later, that if she'd ever had any money, Isabella promised that she would like to create just such a thing, a private house museum. While in Paris, she met the gardeners of Boston and their two daughters who were close to her in age, but she didn't meet their older brother, Jack, until they were all back in the United States and Julia Gardner asked her to come from New York City for a visit. Jack, as John Lowell Gardner II was called, had been at Harvard, but he didn't finish, instead going straight into his father's trading business. He was considered quite the catch. So imagine the upset in Boston social circles when he falls from a girl from New York City. They were married in 1860, just shy of her 20th birthday. They lived with Jack's father at first, but then began building their own home. It took years to complete their home, and you see a photo of it there at 152 Beacon Street in Back Bay. Two years after their wedding, their son, John Lowell Gardner III, was born. They called him Jackie, but sadly he died before his second birthday. Then Isabella had a miscarriage following that, which just wasn't spoken of at the time. So in order to recover from their sadness over Jackie's death and concern that Isabella might never mentally recover from these serious mental blows, it was decided in a family meeting that Jack should take her abroad. Here are some photos of their time in Japan. She kept a diary, a kind of scrapbook of her travels. She wrote, she observed, she drew, she pasted in photographs and sketched and tucked in flowers and leaves, really all the things that we might do to create a personal travel memory. And even though some of the locations that they visited were pretty far flung, it wasn't roughing it by any means. While they were in Egypt and in the Holy Land, they traveled in their own caravan of eight horses, five mules, two donkeys with retainers and tents. Now we have a, a name for that these days that might be glamping, but here is an excerpt from one of Isabella's diaries. She writes, Cairo, this people had stepped out of the Arabian Nights which were no longer tales that we had read, but were bits of real life happening with us looking on. And we had truly come abroad and forgot ourselves. That same day, this is what her husband Jack recorded in his journal. Friday, December 11, 1874. Left Alexandria about eight and a half a.m arrived Cairo at 12.30 p.m., went to Shepherd's Hotel. Very good, except full of fleas. 
what Isabella, what was Isabella Stewart and John Stewart uh, Gardner's life like at home? Here is a photo of them entertaining in their Beacon Street home. And I'm gonna put a circle on it in the next one. There's Isabella right there. Those two white dots in her hair are, are not a flaw in the photo, they're diamonds. And when diamonds are this big, you can bet they have names. One was called the Raja, weighing in at 26 carats. And the other was called Light of India, weighing in at 16 carats. This is not the last we're going to hear of those diamonds. She and John liked to entertain. And certainly there were plenty of tales about her in Boston's social columns, stories that would grow completely out of control. But they actually started with some pretty fantastic truths in the beginning. So apparently, she did visit the zoo and she did manage to bring two lion cubs home to play with. But the tale grew fantastic to become that she was quoted or seen walking a full grown lion on a leash while wearing her jewels on the streets of Boston and the like. She's still quoted though as saying, don't spoil a good story by telling the truth. In 1912, she caused quite a stir at Symphony Hall when she appeared in her seat wearing a white headband with the words, oh, you red socks written on it in red. You could say she was trying in her own way to fit into Boston society. She knew she wasn't well liked uh, and that uh, by everyone and that perhaps that may have caused her some despair, but she didn't seem to dwell on it. Instead, she just got on with life. For example, when she was told that she couldn't get irises to grow at the Gardner home out in Brookline, she just took that as a challenge. She had heated flower beds installed and had lovely irises blooming there and then filled her garden with artists to paint them. It was said, here's a great story, that Mrs. Jack, as she was known, invited a prize fighter to come to this very home that you see on the screen there, 152 Beacon Street, to strip down into his fighting trunks and stand behind a screen so that um, he could delight the ladies at one of her afternoon teas, uh, flexing with his shadow against the screen. According to the story, the ladies wanted to dispense with the screen and the firefighter thereupon came out and flexed his muscles in person for them. One young Roman at the time wrote in her own journal this. She says, of course, father will never let us go to Mrs. Gardner's parties. Father could never feel sure whether the party at Mrs. Jack's music room was for Mozart or Muscles. But it wasn't all fun and games at the Garner house. Isabella took the radical step of enrolling in a lecture course being taught by a Harvard professor in 1878. At this time, this was the same time rather when educating women was considered controversial by plenty of people. Harvard didn't officially start courses for women until it started Radcliffe College the following year. Some suggest her interests in uh, more education was due to the fact that they now had children in their lives. From 1875 on, they raised their three nephews after those nephews became orphaned. The boys were 10, 12, and 14 when they came to live with the Garners. There was another side of Isabella Stewart Garner that we may not often see or know about, and that was that she was a deeply religious person. Husband Jack called her Busy Ella with all of her activities and charities. And another important person came into their lives in 1888, and you see him on the right, that's Bernard Berenson who was still an undergraduate at Harvard when he attracted the attention of the gardeners. He wanted to travel Europe studying literature and he needed funding, he needed money. And they were among a group of people who funded a fellowship for Berenson. He went to Europe in 1887 
and switched from literature to art, becoming a renowned scholar of Italian Renaissance art in particular, and more importantly, perhaps, becoming a connoisseur, an advisor, and a buying agent for Mrs. Jack and others for many, many years. The Gardner Museum tweeted out this quote a few years ago uh, in discussing her goals for the museum with Bernard Berenson, Isabella Stewart wrote, let's aim high, let's aim awfully high. If you don't aim, you can't get there. The artist most closely associated with her through his portraits of her is the American John Singer Sargent. They met through friends. He was a prominent society painter. In 1882, we know this painting. He painted the four daughters of Edward Darley Boyd, and we still marvel at them at the MFA. Then he caused a scandal in Paris with his portrait of Madame X. Her husband, Monsieur X, Monsieur Gautreau, wouldn't accept this portrait of his wife. And it was in Sargent's studio in England when he met Isabella. And you see that photo there on the right. Now, five years later after this, Sargent was in Boston to paint more portraits, this time a portrait of Mrs. Edward Boyd. It was customary for artists who were painting a portrait of their subject to stay with that person. But when Mr. Boyd had to leave town, it wasn't proper to stay, for Sargent to stay at the Boyd household any longer. So he ended up at the gardener's house, staying there. Well, naturally, Isabella wanted him to paint her too. And he did. And she got her own scandal. She was 48 years old. At one of her, what one artist, uh, one author says, most formidable periods, confident and in control. Sargent painted her against a 16th century velvet brocade, patterned and positioned so that her head seems to be crowned. And you can see that in the left there. If you look closely at where her head is, then the pattern of the brocade behind her clearly forms a crown on top of her head. And certainly she's surrounded by a halo. It was Sargent's idea for her to wear her pearls around her waist, but I'm sure she agreed as she was known to be quite proud of her figure. Together, they created a stir. So much power, so much confidence, so much cleavage. Sargent called the work woman, an enigma. It was shown in one 1888 exhibition, and then the nasty gossip started in town. Her husband Jack was angry and he made them take the painting off view, which of course only increased people's interest in it. It was kept at home, but during Jack's life, it was never publicly seen. However, Isabella was quite happy with the portrayal and she put it up in the museum, which she made after Jack's death. She later added a related painting to her collection, another view of Madame X or Madame Gautreau, as her real name is, Drinking a Toast, another work by Sargent. I, I smile at this because it seems to me it, I'd like to interpret it as a, a celebratory toast from one independent-minded woman to another. There's another stunning portrait of Isabella painted a few years later while the gardeners were staying in Venice. The Swedish artist Anders Zorn captured this fresh captivating image of her on the balcony of the Palazzo Barbaro on the Grand Canal. She's 55 years old. Zorn, who had also been staying with the gardeners, had been trying to create a successful portrait of Isabella and was growing anxious. One evening as the gardeners and their group were socializing, Isabella stepped out onto the balcony to see what was happening, then suddenly turned and came back in and he captured the moment. It's as if she is really radiant with light herself. And then there is that long strand of pearls again. Now, just a brief word 
or two about the role that Venice played in their lives. Though Venice, unlike English-dominated Florence, Italy, or church-dominated Rome, Venice was a playground. The light, the color, the water, the crumbling plaster. If you've been, you know, there was never, there's never been more romantic and intriguing city, I don't think. The gardeners were part of a circle of close friends there who gathered often. The Palazzo Barbaro was a medieval palace owned by a Boston family, the Curtises. It was such a hospitable locale that even Ruskin, the art critic, and Whistler, his favorite target, could coexist in the same group while in Venice. And architecturally speaking, this is all going to look familiar in a few minutes when we see how it inspired Isabella Gardner. There was another group of friends, though, who accepted her, who basked in her warmth and generosity. These were the residents of Dabsville. A. Pyatt Andrew, who you see in the upper left corner there, and Isabella Stewart Gardner met one another in 1903. He was an assistant professor of economics at Harvard. He built a summer home called Red Roof on Eastern Point at the edge of Gloucester. His neighbor was Henry Sleeper, who you see down on the lower right of that photo, a talented and popular interior decorator. They had a close group of friends and they named the place Dabsville, building on the letters from their individual names. They included Isabella Stewart Gardner as an honorary resident of Dabsville. She didn't have a home there, but she was welcome in all of theirs. Here she is uh, in a celebratory group uh, dinner one evening, and that's Isabella Stewart Gardner with her back to us in the center of the picture, sitting in a chair with a Y on a cloth draped over the back. And that's because at this point in her life, she started styling her name Isabella by sp spelling it with a Y instead of an I. The group inspired and supported and entertained one another for years. Henry Sleeper built his home there in 1907, just a few doors down from a Pyatt Andrews Red Roof. It's named Beauport, and it is part of the historic New England's collection of homes. So I offer you that as a fabulous field trip up out of Boston at some point. Isabella Stewart Gardner's father, died in 1891 and left her a small fortune. She wasn't nearly as wealthy as those mentioned earlier, but she did inherit $1.75 million at that point in today's value, almost $50 million. So beginning in 1892, she and Jack began to seriously collect some beautiful, serious art for their home on Beacon Hill. She bought 174 paintings in just a little over nine years. Among the highlights, and unfortunately one of the stolen works, is this one here by Vermeer called The Concert. Isabella was in competition, not with other collectors for this work, but with large museums over the Vermeer. She was told that both the Louvre and London's National Gallery wanted to buy it, but they didn't want to be seen to bid against one another because that was bad form, perhaps. Well, it worked out for her because she came out on top with a bid that in today's uh, money would be only about $150,000. What, what a bargain, huh? <laughs> the work on the wall in the painting by Vermeer, the work hanging on the right in the painting is an, another actual painting that was owned by Vermeer. It's called The Percurist by Dirk van Baberen. It was owned by Vermeer and guess where it's been since 1950? It's been at Boston's Museum of Fine Arts. In 1886, uh, 96 rather, Bernard Berenson, recommended that Isabella buy a Rembrandt self-portrait dated 1629, the first ever 
that he did. And he sent her a cable, just very succinct. Yes, Rembrandt or no Rembrandt? Her answer was equally succinct, yes. Here you see it in a photo hanging on the wall of their home at 152 Beacon Street. Considered by many art scholars to be the most important painting in Boston, Titian's, Titian's Europa was painted by that Italian artist for King Philip of Spain. Years later, it was part of a royal dowry sent to England when a Spanish princess was supposed to marry Charles I, Charles Stuart. The marriage negotiations fell through, but the painting stayed in England. Since Isabella could trace her family ancestry back to the royal Stuarts, she felt she needed to have this piece. It was an important addition to her collection, uh, at least because one author feels that it gave her collecting a focus, Italian art, of many different periods from medieval through Baroque. Titian's Europa is quite the work and it's a work that the artist Peter Paul Rubens himself called the greatest painting in the world. Another important painting was bought um, and this one was the Zuberon on the right, Madonna, a uh, Virgin of Mary, uh, I'm sorry, the Virgin of Mercy, a, a Madonna and Child by the Spanish artist Zuberon. Isabella hung it in a private room in their first home, but then she created a Spanish chapel for it at her museum, and it was placed there along with a sign that read in memoriam because it was said that she felt that the infant Jesus bore a strong resemblance to her son, Jackie. And Christ carrying the cross is from the workshop of Giovanni Bellini, perhaps also one of her favorite works. It's an intimate, small devotional work and the way that she arranged it only amplifies that quality. She set it on a table where the viewer herself uh, could sit in a chair and meditate on it. On the table, she also put a silver cup, and you see it there, and filled it with violets. The flowers reminded her of her husband, Jack. He always bought her violets. The museum continues this sweet tradition today. If they can't get violets, they get another flower of the same color. Interestingly, Berenson helped to acquire this devotional piece, but he added in his note to her this quote, he said, well, you shall have it, yet it somehow is not the kind of thing I think of for you. Signaling to me anyway, that even those somewhat close to Isabella underestimated her religious devotion. She sat or rather stood for a portrait by Lowell's own James McNeil Whistler, which you see on the left, which he titled A Little Note in Yellow and Gold. And later, years later, she purchased a similar sized piece, not of herself, but of a model nearly nude entitled The Violet Note. These two were exhibited together, these little pastel drawings and tongues wagged as people assumed they were both her. She let them think so. She was especially in tune with artists and their feelings. Whistler wrote in a book to her, this inscription, to Mrs. Gardner, whose appreciation for the work of art is only equaled by her understanding of the artist. Now, in the course of buying all of this art, Isabella and Jack began to run out of room at 152 Beacon Street, and they talked about what to do. He was in favor of building in a new section of town near the drained swamps and the newly designed parks to the west of Beacon Hill and the Common. She wanted to try to expand the house on Beacon Hill. Suddenly though, in December of 1898, Jack Gardner died at the age of 61. Isabella mourned him, of course, but she threw her energy into plans. Only they weren't her plans, they were Jack's plans. Two weeks after his death, 
she bought land. The newly created area called Back Bay Park had been laid out by none other than Frederick Law Olmsted, even though the time it was still considered a bit remote. John had encouraged her to build her Venetian palace. So you see this map here, and if you recognize the uh, lakes and, and ponds and forested area of um, what we now call the Back Bay, but the Fens area, she called her house that she began to build Fenway Court. She retained William Sears to begin drawing up plans for the new home and museum. Over the course of building Fenway Court, they went back and forth with changes, arguments, threatened workers strikes, lack of permits and the ever looming fear of inspectors coming. She understood the adage that if you want something done right, you have to do it yourself. Apparently, she wouldn't let the workers set the columns in place without her being there. Staircases were built and then rebuilt to her exact specifications. And there on the right, you see a photo of her up on a ladder in the courtyard with paint brushes showing the Italian painters how to create the paint effect and the pink color she was after. So she brought in European workers to create her own Venetian palace. When it was finished, 150 invitations went out for the evening of January 1st, 1903 with the request to be punctual. It was an evening like no other Boston had seen. The receiving line stretched out the door and around the block. It's January now, remember that. Uh, and that's because guests were made to walk up a staircase uh, to be greeted by, and of course pay homage to the lady of the house, Isabella Stewart Gardner, where um, she was wearing on her head that evening, those two diamonds again, the Raja and the Light of India, but as one visitor noted, they were now on wires and so looked like antenna, if you will, sprouting from her headband. Guests were treated to a musical concert in the music room at the end of which mirrored panels were that had shielded their views of any of the other rooms were rolled away. And then they got to see this view, the courtyard at night, flowers, birds, water fountains, candlelight. It was an overwhelming and stunning unveiling. What she created was and remains astounding, yet from the exterior, you'd be hard pressed to find a plainer building around. On the interior, of course, though, each of the sides is like the facade of a Venetian palace, and it was constructed along Renaissance building principles. In the center, in the garden, oasis of warmth and sunshine throughout the year, especially a cold, snowy New England, and in the center of the courtyard, a mosaic of Medusa, that terrifying female from history. So what happens when you build a world-class collection of art that you love and you place it inside a palace that you've created and you invite the public to come inside? The plan was to open the museum to about 200 people a day for 10 days at Easter and 10 days at Thanksgiving, but there were problems immediately. There were damages, there were thefts of small items, and it made her change her plans to allow only art students to arrive to come in, and she charged them a dollar a piece to help defray the costs of security. It was said that she was a nervous wreck on open days. By the way, her private apartments are on the top floor of Fenway Court. In 1914, she renovated Fenway Court. She took out the two-story tall music room and she created two galleries so she had more space to put art. She created, one of them was this Spanish cloister, which she created. And one of the reasons for this was to accommodate a painting which she didn't own at the time. It was Sargent's large work called El Jaleo. It belonged to a friend who, uh, perhaps unwisely, 
had lent it to her while he closed his home for the summer. The next time he saw his painting, she had created the Spanish cloister with its carved arch frame of antique stones and floodlights along the bottom to mimic the painted floodlight in the picture. Apparently, he could do nothing but present her with the painting as a gift on the spot that he saw it. Isabella Stewart uh, Gardner began living a period uh, at this point rather econ economically. She reportedly would send her man out for two oranges instead of a dozen, or she would be seen wearing a dress that was made from a brocade sofa cover. What she was doing, what she had in mind, was to try to squirrel away and keep enough money um, and leave it behind for the running of her museum. And there really was no idea of what kind of money that would take. There was a trust created to run Fenway Court and Henry Sleeper, owner of Beauport from Dabsville, was named trustee. Isabella so admired what he built at, da at Beauport and he loved what she had done at Fenway Court. So it just made perfect sense. She left a provision that if anything moved or if other works were brought in, the whole thing could go to Harvard and they could do with it what they please, sell it if they wanted. She also made another provision that every year on her birthday, a memorial service would be held in the chapel. She broke all kinds of rules setting up her museum, but as we said in the introduction, perhaps we can understand this better when we learn that her personal motto was, it is my pleasure. It's my pleasure. She arranged things the way she wanted with relationships between objects that may escape us at first. As you know, there are not any wall labels that you would find in a traditional museum. They're not explanations necessarily for visitors. So it's a completely interactive experience. We're presented with assemblages and we can put them together and make them relate one to one another by style or color or theme or shape. They're endless possibilities. It's actually quite exciting when you think of it that way. In this room below Titian's Europa, there is, and I've put a blue circle around, oval around it, there's a 17th century statuette set on its side in order to mimic the pose of Europa above. Now, maybe you were like me the first time I saw this, I almost reached out and tried to set it upright. Um, uh, no, I, I grabbed hold of myself and not the statue, which is good. But um, I, I thought the thing had been tipped over. Um, when it was, but it was tipped over on purpose. Behind the statue, she put a piece of pale green and silver silk from one of her dresses, a creation by Worth of Paris, which had shocked Boston when she wore it. Um, so it's here and perhaps it's continuing to the sort of shock Boston. On Christmas Eve in 1919, she suffered an embolism that left her partly paralyzed, but she didn't let the public know how disabled she'd become. Two years later or so, Sargent came in to paint her portrait for the last time. In this watercolor, we see her confident and poised. It's painted 34 years after her triumphant black dress pearls around the waist portrait. She's still an enigma. We see calm, controlled, and powerful old woman, quietly sitting, wrapped in layers of white and propped up on her sofa. She is bravely facing life and the end of life straight on. She died just two years later in 1924 at the age of 84. She was a tastemaker and a trendsetter. Art, religion, social freedoms, these were interests that motivated her. She created a new type of building, a private collection museum without any or much evidence of a domestic life involved, like the Frick in New York City, the Walters in Baltimore, or the Getty Villa in Malibu. In the words of a former curator at the museum, Isabella Stewart Gardner deliberately created a sense of mystery about herself. No single interpretation can encompass the personal poetry of her marvelous installations. Um, now, 
the thing that most people will address the elephant in the room, the thing that many of us know about and have been drawn to in recent years is the theft. One quick note before we get to that though. Some of you have been with me over the past years and we've talked or me, we already know about the monuments men. Um, if you do, the last time we saw George Stout was in this photo in 1945 at the salt mines as um, the Michelangelo was being transported out of the mines, um, safely recovered from where the Nazis had hidden it. Um, it. He became the director at the Gardner Museum there from 1955 to 1970. And then you know that um, on the morning of March 18th, $500 million worth of art was stolen from the uh, now called Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, not Fenway Court. It remains the single largest property theft in the world. So uh, with that, I will end. I will open it up to, um, we'll go back to meditate on that. We'll go back to Robert now if we want and see if we have any questions or comments. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Mary. A wonderful job. Uh, folks, at this point, uh, please uh, get your questions into the Q&A, and uh, we will address uh, as many as we can uh, before 12 o'clock. Uh, Eva Jane asks, do any photos exist of Isabella's private quarters? Um, not that I've seen. Good question. Uh, I have not seen any. No. Uh, Karen asks, is the Y on the front of the house museum an homage to her first name? You know, how can it, I mean, I don't know for sure, but golly, once I saw that and I knew that she used a Y for her name sometimes, um, it does really stand to reason, doesn't it? I would like to think so. Uh, Pat asks, is Berenson the same person who was involved in the J.P. Morgan's librarian? Most likely, yes. Um, I haven't read that book yet, um, but yeah, Bernard Berenson um, grew to be a very influential uh, scholar um, and, uh, as I say, buying agent for uh, the wealthy at this time. Now, I asked these two questions before the Zoom started. Kathy wants to know, do you have your own theory about the theft? And Jody asks, are there any leads on the heist? I thought I heard that it, should, it was about to be solved. Oh gosh, I hope so. <laughs> um, now, Robert and I were discussing it a little bit. I've read some of those books and you'll get, uh, when he sends out the references tomorrow, you'll see some of those listed uh, in the material that you can read if you haven't read already, seen the TV shows and all. Um, no. Uh, I, I guess, as I was saying, to uh, I, I'm not a native Bostonian. You can tell, can't you, from my accent? Uh, but so uh, I guess I've never really uh, completely appreciated the uh, power and infiltration that the uh, mafia has had in Boston in the past. Um, just didn't grow up hearing about it. So it's possible, of course. Um, I'm stunned that with a $10 million reward, that more clues haven't been found and that nothing has come to light. Um, 13 pieces, that's pretty, pretty surprising for not a single thing to have come up. So I like that notion that maybe it's about to be solved. I'm gonna go with that, that'd be lovely. And you know, uh, if you've been to this Bella Stewart Gardner Museum and we switch now to that scene in the lower right, I really quite love the way and of course, this is in keeping with her rules that nothing changed. Of course, she didn't want anything taken either, but I love that they've left the empty frames there. It's a stunning, I think, um, poignant reminder of, of the theft of what's been lost. Yep. Um, oh, here I'll go for my, here we go. I, I told Robert I would include these. Here are some of the other things that were stolen. Um, this is the section where you make a note that if you see any of these things uh, coming up on eBay or a yard sale, please buy it, uh, even if uh, it may not be. So here's Rembrandt, here's the Manet. Uh, there's the Vermeer, yes, please. Um, there's a bronze vessel, uh, ancient bronze vessel there. Um, and uh, so those are some of the some of the 13 missing. Uh, Beverly asks, uh, what happened to the nephews? That's a good question. I, I don't I don't 
recall off the top of my head. I'm sure that they uh, did just fine in the, that they were part of the Gardner family. Um, so um, I couldn't answer that right off the top of my head. I'm sorry. Uh, an anonymous attendee asks, how did they fund the museum after her death? Uh, she set up money. Um, she she left uh, money for the running of it. She was very conscious about setting up a um, a trust for it, and it was to that one that she um, uh, appointed Henry Sleeper first. Although he didn't live much longer than Isabella Stewart did. I mean, not not too terribly longer. Um, but yes, uh, um, they she set up a trust. Speaking of money, uh, Karen asks, what was the source of wealth uh, of the Stuarts and the gardeners? Uh, industry, um, mercantile, uh, real estate, these types of investments were what was um, typical of the uh, mid to, this is post-Civil War era. And so while they weren't uh, operating on the echelon of uh, on the same level as the Rockefellers and Vanderbilts, they nevertheless uh, were able to make build fortunes in industry and uh, especially in uh, in real estate. Uh, Francis asks, when and why was the museum's name changed? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I should know that, but I don't really accept that. I think Fenway Court just didn't um, really describe it the way that it ought to be described. But that's a good question. Uh, and I think um, uh, this is a book that, a handbook that was written by uh, Hilliard T. Goldfarb, who was really uh, part of the museum for many, many, many years. And uh, I, bet, I bet the answer is right in there. Uh, let's see, Rocco wants to know, why is the exterior of the museum so plain? <laughs> uh, that's a good question. Uh, stylistically, uh, I think it fits in with the uh, neighborhood a little bit better. It would be sort of jarring. Um, and really her interest was to um, create the palace within. Yeah, you know? so um, it's true of Renaissance uh, I will just say this, historically, there are precedents when you look at Renaissance palazzos. Now, Venice is an unusual uh, case, of course, because everything is open to the water and we are seeing those gorgeous facades uh, on the exterior. But if you were to go to Florence or if you were to go to Rome and look at a Renaissance palazzo uh, from, from the 14, 15, 1600s, they have very plain exteriors generally. And then they may have a door into a courtyard that is a splendid, wonderful, glorious place. But their street face was pretty sober. A um, lot of rusticated stone, window here and there. You had really no hint of what uh, treasures lay inside. So there's a historical precedent for that, for building it that way. Uh, Michelle asks, how does the newer addition fit in with Isabella's views on keeping the palace as it was when she was alive? Well, that's a good question. I mean, I, I personally, I think that they did the best they could, couldn't they? They have very strict limitations about, about uh, changing what she had built. Uh, but I do believe that the spirit of it, um, that is that she is, they're able to reach broader audiences, they're able to look at other parts of her collection, which are, you know, not everything was on view, for instance, um, in, her, in her display. And so they're able to have a beautiful uh, resource that they've built for the public to, to be attached gently, ever so lightly, to the original building and, um, and provide the public uh, and art students and everybody more opportunities to learn more about the collection. Uh, when you, you can look at their website, but also uh, I'm a, I like to use Instagram a lot and the Gardner Museum on Instagram is a fun way to see almost, well, quite regularly, they'll post images of things that you might not see, but they've brought out to light to, um, to have an exhibit of or to share some scholars words on. So I think they did a fine job. And I think that she, since her goal was to um, share 
this art with people. I think they're they're living up to her ideals. Uh, let's see here. Diane asks, what was Il Isabella's religious affiliation and what church did she attend in Boston? Oh, I, um, I well, she, I imagine she was Catholic. Uh, the Stuarts historically are Catholic. Um, and uh, I don't know what church she went to. Yeah. She did build a private chapel um, for herself in, in her museum. Uh, Francis asks, when were visitors other than art students allowed back into the museum and was Isabella Stewart Gardner still alive at that time? Um, these are really detailed and good questions. <laughs> I, I don't know exactly when they turned it around. It may have been after her death. I don't know. Here's another detailed question. The mm. family of T.S. Eliot also spent summers at Eastern Point. Did, did Isabella Stewart Gardner ever meet him or any of his family members? Uh, I don't know. What Do we know what years that was? Because that would tell us. And uh, we'll have to come back to that. Uh, Anne yeah. asks, are her pearls on display in the museum? Not that I've seen. Um, aren't they something? <laughs> They look like there are a couple of rubies thrown in along as well. So, um, yeah. Uh, Dory says, uh, I heard that the Gardner Museum sold many Asian collections during the economic downtime. Are there plans to get those back? I wouldn't know. I don't know. That sounds like a good question for them on their um, website. They may address it on their website. Uh, they certainly address the theft on their website. Uh, Natalie asks, did Isabella leave some kind of list of her favorite places or museums that she hmm. visited during her trips around the world? Well, she left those, uh, she did leave those beautiful travel books. Those have been published uh, or reproduced rather and, um, and studied. And so if you uh, go to a library if you google um you know travel albums of isabella stewart gardner or something like that you will see a, a more modern reproduction of them uh, so she did it that way she did it that way she actually was an exceedingly private individual though and she grew more private as she um as she aged and so uh there are reports of her spending time uh, burning, destroying a lot of her letters and correspondence in the last few years of her life. And so that has left a lot of questions for people and we may not ever know the answers to them. So folks, we're gonna start to wind down. Uh, let uh, Mary know in the chat if you enjoyed today's presentation. Uh, a few more questions for you, Mary. Uh, Michelle asks, are her two big diamonds on display at the museum? And uh, Teresa also asked a similar question. What happened to her diamonds she wore in her hair? I don't know. I, I don't believe the jewelry is on display. Mm -hmm. And um, because the, well, yeah. And, and so I do not know. I do not know. I, and as far as I know, there's no photo of her wearing them like antenna. Uh, but they were they were noteworthy. And uh, before everyone started putting uh, their thank yous in the comments section, um, a couple of folks had noted that um, one of the nephews has a historical house uh, in North Andover that you can uh, wonderful. Do tours well, I'm sure in. they did. I'm sure they did quite well. Uh, they had a, uh, an unfortunate start in life by losing their parents, but. Um, Aunt and Uncle Gardner did well by them, I know, and um, and and so that's good to know. That's good to know. Uh, an anonymous attendee asks, uh, "Where is Isabella buried?" Oh, that's a good question. Again, uh, I I don't know. I'm I will try to find out where. And uh, Renee had a nice antidote. She said, "Anyone with the name Isabella has a free admission, free lifetime admission yes, to the Isabella right. Stewart Gardner Museum. That's yeah. absolutely right. Isn't that yeah. lovely? Yeah. That's fun. I uh, know it is fun, isn't it? it Eva is fun. says that she's buried at uh, Mount Auburn. Oh, and, fun. Thank you. Let's see. I think there was also somebody looked up her religion. Uh, let's see. Episcopalian, and she was involved in the Copley Square Church. 
Oh, okay, thanks. Um, I'm sorry, yes. Well, so the Stuarts were famously Catholic, uh, if we go back to English history, but um, all right, yeah. So she um, is Episcopalian, that's good to know. Thank you. Right, and I don't, I don't distrust anything uh, in the chat, but um, you know, folks don't often cite their sources, so I'm, a, I'm always a little reluctant to, 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 um, to, to throw out answers without, uh, sure. uh, you know. But anyway, I'm sure that's correct. Uh, so Julia says, "Thank you. A really fascinating talk. So glad to have been able to join you from Oxford over in the United Kingdom." Uh oh, there we go. So we were international today. Uh, Johnny says, thank you. Very interesting and informative. Marilyn says, wonderful. Myra said she loved it. Karen said this was great. Martha said, super thank you. Uh, let's see, I'm not going to read all these, but obviously uh, I'll save the chat for you, uh, Mary, and you can see all the nice positive comments. Oh, from, that's uh, great. Uh, thank you. So uh, it is 12 o'clock, Mary. Do you have any last words for the group uh, before we wrap up? No, just please go visit if you haven't already. And I've put in, I've never seen this in person, but I've put this in that they do. Another thing she she uh, set in stone was that they do this. They grow these long nasturtiums in the greenhouses and they hang them out the windows once uh, one week or two a year. And so look on the website for that as well. It might be very splendid to see. Thank you all for joining me today. I really appreciate it. All right. And the chat uh, has since cited their sources. Look at that. Uh, so Brilliant. I want to thank you all for joining us. I want to thank the 13 other libraries that partnered with Tewksbury uh, to, uh, to make uh, today's event possible. Uh, always want to thank the friends of the Tewksbury Library. Look for an email from me tomorrow with a link to a feedback survey, link to this recording, information about some other upcoming virtual art programs. I'm not exaggerating, folks. I think we have 10 lined up uh, in September, October, and November. And I think Mary's um, doing at least three of those. Uh, so, uh, and then uh, uh, Mary also has a handout that I'll provide tomorrow. So anyway, bottom line, look in your email tomorrow morning, uh, important email coming your way. So thank you all so much. And I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot, Robert. Bye-bye, Thank you, Mary. Everybody. Thank you. Have a good one. Thanks, you too.